Hello everybody and welcome to this week's Shoesmith Live. I'm Samantha Hope, the Graduate Recruitment Manager for Shoesmith and I look after uh, the Trainee Solicitor Programme in 13 locations across the UK. And today I'm joined by Shoesmith CEO Simon Boss. So welcome Simon, thank you so Hello, much for hi, coming Sam. on. Yep. Um, today we're going to be talking a little bit about the operational side of Shoesmith. Simon's experience and why he chose a career in law and some top training contract tips for you as well. So before we get started, I just want to let you know that we're filming from Milton Keynes today and I want to know where are you watching us from? So if you just type into the comments um, where you're watching us from, it's really interesting to know how far our videos reach. Um, so Simon, if you could just start us off today by telling me a little bit about your studies and why you chose a career in law. Well, I think, um, to be honest, I didn't choose a career in law. Um, going right back to the start, uh, I'd got no idea about being a lawyer at all. Uh, I was interested in other things at sort of 16, 17, primarily not being in an office, not being in that sort of um, industry at all, but maybe working outside. Uh, geology particularly was of interest to me. But um, long and the short of it is that didn't quite happen. And uh, I was thinking about maybe just doing a, a general business type degree that would take me somewhere. Um, uh, business studies, accountancy, law, and one of the teachers that I worked with at that point, uh, or, or, or was at uh, the college with me, said, um, you'll never get anywhere in law, don't bother. Um, and that was enough, really, to raise the challenge for me to actually think, well, I think I probably can. I'll show you, sort yeah. of, mate. So long and the short of it is, that got me started. Um, uh, I went to Birmingham University, um, read law, um, and sort of got on the conveyor belt. Um, having got that far, I thought, um, you know, why, why not continue and push on to be a solicitor? And that sort of got, got me going on my career in the first place. Okay, fantastic. So um, you were elected um, as Shoesmith CEO last year in 2018, um, and you'd worked at the firm since around 2005. Yes. So tell me a little bit about your professional journey then, from studies, um, where did you go next and how did you end up in this role? Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, I had a great time at university. Uh, Birmingham University was, was, was really good. Um, if I'm honest, I didn't really get law or enjoy it, particularly at university. It, it came alive a little bit later. Um, so I did law, did uh, a finals at Guildford, um, and then had a, I was going to say a training contract, but actually training contracts didn't exist then. Um, Article Clark, I was one of those, um, uh, back in the mid-80s mid with a firm called Edge and Ellison. Um, uh, which has changed now, merged a couple of times since 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 then. But um, uh, that was a really great great place because it, mm. it it got me going in terms of the reality of law as opposed to the theory of law. Um, my first seat was in the tax team, tax wills and probate, um, and my trainee uh, principal, um, training principal, I think quickly worked out that I probably wasn't going to be the greatest tax lawyer ever, so it got me working in 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 wills and probate, and I started doing a bit of real estate which is actually where I ended up um, focusing um, uh, ultimately uh, and, and realise that actually you follow a process, um, get stuck into actually applying some of your land law um, and, and actually transactions happen. Assets turn into cash and, and, mm. and, and reverse. That brought it alive for me, that sort yeah. of beginning to transact um, uh, style. So that, that got me going. I qualified a couple of years later. Um, interestingly, compared to today, um, a much broader brief in terms of type, type of work uh, and maybe a the challenge for today is maybe we specialise too early. Um, people are forced down routes that are perhaps a little bit too narrow, too early in their careers. But uh, um, I was able then to do a broad range of banking, some recoveries work, some real estate work, some commercial work for uh, two or three years before I began to narrow down mm. more on real estate. Um, uh, but that, that got me going. Um, so first firm, Edge Ellison, um, for 14, 15 years, worked my way through. Um, moved in 2001 to Evershed's. Eversheds for four or so years and then joined Shoesmiths in 2005. Yeah. And what about your career journey at Shoesmiths then? So you um, started off, I think, you had a, a really big part to play in the development of the Birmingham office. And then where did it go from there? Well, I had a part to play, but um, uh, there were many people that actually played part of that, that story. Um, uh, Shoesmiths uh, decided to uh, push out from some of its sort of traditional homes, um, uh, really about sort of 2002, 2003, and Birmingham was the, was the first version of that. So when I joined Birmingham in 2005, um, there were a number of partners, about 20 people in total, um, uh, and a, a core strength in real estate. So that seemed to be like a really natural place to, for me to start. Mm -hmm. <coughs> um, some of the people, the partners that got in then, had 
got a very good reputation in real estate. So teaming up with those and, 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 and moving that on was, was great. A um, couple of years in, I headed up the real estate team in Birmingham. Um, uh, I say it's been a fantastic journey for me. Shoesmith has been great. It allowed me then to sort of grow and develop some of my national experience. And, and a few years later, I joined the Partnership Council, which is our elected um, strategy partner body. Um, a few years after that, I became the national head of real estate. And then uh, last year, um, the CEO opportunity arose. And again, that's that's all come about. So yeah, yeah Shoesmith has been just fantastic, <laughs> really good. So for um, many law firms that our viewers will be researching, the firm has a managing partner. So how does Shoesmith structure differ in that we have you as a CEO? I think to an extent that the terms are interchangeable. Um, if I think all the way back to my first firm, they had a managing partner who was absolutely fantastic at his job. He'd probably be called the CEO today. I think the terms are essentially um, interchangeable. Um, maybe it's a bit more corporate speak, um, albeit Shoesmith is still very much a traditional partnership and, and, and really values that and the culture that that particular brings. But uh, um, so like a managing partner, um, my role is to um, help set and refine and develop the strategy, but, but also to ensure that the firm is delivering its strategy. Um, so that we're actually investing and growing the areas that we want to, that our partners and that all of our team um, from top to bottom have the resources that they need to get on and do what they've got to do. Um, and that we're looking around one or two corners. Um, doing some things perhaps dis differently, perhaps um, one or two things we haven't done before, but mm. beginning to sort of shape and develop the business as, um, as the world moves moves around us, that we're actually all part of part of moving the whole thing forward. So, yeah. so ultimately, I put it another way, um, uh, in the end, the buck stops somewhere. That's perhaps slightly negative, I don't know, but in the <laughs> end, it does. Uh, yeah. And that has to be with the CEO, I think and that's right. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so coming in to the CEO role, <clears throat> excuse me, so when, I, when you come into any brand new role, you come in with fresh eyes. Um, so you can you tell me a little bit about where the firm is going. What is the strategy for Shoesmiths? Sure. Um, well, coincidentally, um, coming into the role um, pretty much exactly timed with actually my, our next strategic period. Um, so 2019 to th 2022. Um, so really pushing on on our UK focus. Um, uh, we're not planning to uh, open offices around the world, but really focusing on, on UK business um, of the highest quality, highest calibre, um, but also um, uh, looking at the client experience um, and really ensuring that we are doing everything across our team. Everyone in Shootsmiths is doing the best to deliver the best client experience, the best client service that we possibly can. Not just the lawyers, including the lawyers, but, but, but actually yeah. everyone's really focused on that. Um, within that, growth remains um, a real opportunity. Um, for us as a firm. Uh, there are some markets we've been in for many years, some locations we've been in for many years, um, equally others that are relatively fresh and new. So there's real, I think, uh, use that word again, opportunity for us to actually attract talent, attract new business um, uh, across the UK where we haven't been before, but also refine our, our skill sets. Um, uh, we're really strong in some areas, in other areas, um, again, there's room, room for growth. Um, some of that is quite niche, some of it is, is less niche. Our real estate team is a bit bigger than our corporate team. So we're actually just looking to rebalance that mm. um, a little bit and really push um, on in terms of our corporate exposure. Um, push on in terms of some of our you know, major corporate PLC relationships and develop not just the relationships we've got, got with those, but actually areas in those businesses that, that we haven't got. And then if you come back to locations, London is relatively new for us. So that would be one that I would expect us to grow in, in the next few years. But equally, if you go further north, Leeds relatively new. Um, Scotland, Edinburgh we've been for a few years, but, but Glasgow is new. Mm. Um, Belfast, also relatively new for us, so the whole Northern Ireland thing. But I'm not letting anyone off the hook because locations that are bigger and um, better developed, you might say, in terms of size, so Birmingham, Manchester, um, here in Milton Keynes and, and others, you know, there's, there's work for us to do everywhere. Um, I, think, um, I think that UK focus just means that we have set a, a limit to what we're trying to do in one sense. So we're not spreading our two, ourselves too thin. Mm. And I think um, uh, whilst our competitors around us have their own strategies, um, and many of them are developing global and international strategies, um, uh, and they are investing down there, and that's perfectly valid, that's, that's a good place to go, but it's just not where we're going. And I think maybe if some of those are looking at doing that, there are clients and um, individuals who perhaps might think, actually, Shoesmiths can look after me a bit better. I don't necessarily need a global law firm that has all that infrastructure. I, I just need, need the UK bit. But maybe just one last thing, you know, in terms of fresh eyes, international work. Mm. Um, we do international work. We just do it off the UK platform. Um, so I'd expect our international work that we do 
uh, with either other law firms or uh, other global entities. Um, will continue to grow and be a major part of what we're doing off the UK platform. Yeah, and that's definitely something that people might not realise that we do at Schismas is international work. And actually we've got um, a couple of international secondments, one which are a trainee and a qualified solicitor, they're in Japan at the moment. So that's an amazing opportunity that you wouldn't normally expect perhaps to get from a UK based law firm. Yeah, absolutely. We've also got a, a team out in Dubai right now. Yeah. Um, with a range of juniors through to some of our most senior partners working on a heavyweight piece of litigation. Um, you know, there's nothing wrong with having uh, offices in all the major cities in the UK, but that doesn't prevent you doing um, international work if, if you haven't. Yeah. Um, it's in the end um, just working with the clients and building the client relationships, whether the clients here in the UK or sitting in an office in New York or Hong Kong, it doesn't matter. Yeah, I think one of our first year trainee solicitors who only joined the firm a couple of weeks ago is out in Dubai with that team. So an amazing opportunity, first few weeks into the yeah. job. Yeah. So. Um, Guys who are watching, you can tag a colleague or a friend in this post if you think they, they should be watching this video right now. <coughs> and you can ask your questions. So you can just type those into the comments and ask your questions to us and we will answer those for you. Um, we've had a couple of questions that have already come in uh, via <coughs> Instagram. So um, the first one that I'm going to ask Simon is from DDXXPP. Um, and they want to know, what did you find difficult as a junior lawyer and why? Mm -hmm. um, I thought it was a great question because the answer is loads, absolutely mm -hmm. loads. Um, uh, if I go right back to basics, I can think of arriving day one, being sat in a room uh, with another trainee um, uh, and there's a phone in front of you and no one's shown you how to work the phone. You know, it rings, how do you transfer a call? Um, so some really basic stuff that probably is as true today as it was mm -hmm. then, that if no one actually shows you how to do the basic stuff, how on earth do you sort of pick it up through osmosis? Well, possibly, and of course you can ask. Um, uh, yeah, other things I found difficult, uh, I guess, was sort of early on not being afraid, not just to ask questions, but also to, um, to say you don't know. Um, it doesn't come naturally, um, either if, I don't know, you're a little bit competitive or that you've done well academically. To actually say, actually, I don't know the answer to that yeah. is quite, quite, it can be quite a test. And, and actually, there's nothing wrong you're saying that to a client. I don't know the answer to that, but I, I know someone who does, or I, I, I can do something with it, I can take it somewhere. There needs to be that sort of answer. You can't leave someone hanging uh, in limbo, as it were. But um, uh, yeah, being, being able to show your own frailty, and actually also, I suppose, um, being yourself. Um, uh, it doesn't always feel natural to be natural, but actually that really builds relationships and people get to know you much more quickly. And that's that's great in an organisation. It's great reaching out to other intermediaries and of course client side. Mm. People work with people in the end. <clears throat> it's almost so cliche to say be yourself. And we say it all the time when we're talking about careers advice or coming to an assessment centre or an interview, try and be yourself because that's the only thing you have that's really unique. Um, and it always sounds so cheesy, but it is true that it's a people business as well, isn't it? We're selling services and, and people relationships. Yeah, absolutely. Of course, brand matters because that creates perception. Um, structure and infrastructure matters because you, you can't do what you've got to do without the stuff that sits behind you. But actually, in the end, whether it's working as a team in an organisation, a team that's across a number of organisations on a particular project, it's, it's, it's all about that people interaction. Mm. And that's just how you get on with people. Yeah. And guess what? You know, just, just as being as natural as you possibly can and... Uh, it'll be more enjoyable, of course, and actually you'll get much more from it. Sounds so simple when you put it like that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe. <laughs> um, okay, so let's have a look at some more of these questions that we've got in here. So we've talked a little bit about your role and how you um, came to work at Shearsmiths and how you developed into the CEO role. Um, we've talked a little bit about the strategy and where we see the firm going. So I just want to move um, to something slightly different, but something that I think you're quite passionate about and that we're, as a firm, have been focused on for a little while, but we're going to be driving more change in the area, and that's social mobility. Yeah. So, um, and that's all about really creating opportunities for those who might find it hard to access a career in law. Um, people still see a career in law as being perhaps an elitist um, kind of subject to access or career. So can you tell me a little bit more about why you think it's important that we widen that access? Yeah. Um, if I can put that in some context first um, and then perhaps I'll answer that specifically. Um, I think it's really important that people um, engage with the question why do I come to work and what do I get out of it? Um, there has to be, I think, a, a more meaningful 
reality to work or a, a deeper purpose than a pure transaction. Um, that's my role, those are my hours, that's what I get paid, These, this is the training to go with it. Yeah, of course those are all the building blocks, but actually if, if there's not a greater emotional engagement with what gets me out of bed in the morning and what mm. charges me, and, and actually what, what, what difference am I making um, either today or over a period of time, I think those are all really important questions. And I think to a greater or lesser extent, questions that businesses are increasingly focusing on. Um, so within that, there are a whole load of things that, that then can and should go on. Um, so, you know, what is business doing around climate change? You know, that I think that's a really important question. Mm. Um, and actually, if a business can feel it's beginning to make a difference in that, then um, does that begin to you know, satisfy that need to feel your organisation that is properly plugged in? So, social mobility. Um, uh, as an industry, uh, I don't think law has the greatest record. Um, uh, whether reality, and I think there's a bit of that, and whether perception, there's a bit of that. Um, I think those that aren't naturally um, exposed to either professional service background or indeed law, how do you ever realise that your talent, and talent can come from anywhere, mm -hmm. might actually work in that environment? Um, how do you feel, um, and, and how are you supporting getting over an assumption that actually it's not for me because my, my background, socio-economic, my face doesn't fit, or just I perhaps haven't quite got the confidence to go there. So I, th I think there's a huge amount to do that I think is, is really, really important in terms of part of, part of in a way, our, our purpose here, which is about allowing people to thrive. Whatever your skill set, whether as a lawyer or indeed, this isn't necessarily just about lawyers, um, you know, more than half our people are not lawyers here. Mm. There's a whole infrastructure from IT to the, you know, the, whole, the whole piece um, where you need, you need talent. And I think if, if you're in a particular place at a moment in time, and feeling you can't get that talent out, then I think as an organisation um, like us, you should be thinking about how you how you can reach out um, and open people's minds to actually that they can thrive. In fact, maybe the opposite to my experience when someone told me you couldn't do law. Um, reverse that round and actually have someone <coughs> saying, absolutely you can and you, this is how you do it. These are the things you need to think about. Yeah, and I think we've just given the advice to be yourself, but it's creating that environment where Shoesmiths or any other business is enabling people to be themselves without judgment and without um, considering that their accent doesn't fit into the office. Yes. Or, yeah. yeah, so uh, absolutely. So it sort of begs the question, what are we doing? Well, well, quite a lot, um, but we need to do more in, in the social mobility space. Um, I work in schools and colleges. I work with things like apprenticeships. Um, I work in terms of recruitment through the graduate recruitment program. All, all of these things um, I think should be playing to opening people's minds to the possibility of what they potentially could achieve. Um, but there's more to do. We, we signed up, as have many organisations now, signed up to the Social Mobility Pledge uh, in November 2008. Yep. Um, uh, and just over the last couple of months we've taken that further in terms of working with Justine Greening, who's leading that, uh, uh, leading that initiative, and the Social Mobility Pledge team, to actually look at how we can take this further. Um, and at the moment we're the only law firm working with, with her team mm. um, uh, on that, uh, and we're looking at doing some research in that space. Um, developing the thinking a bit further and from that developing some further actions that we and maybe others can take. So the next three, four, five months um, I'd like this to take this another level um, uh, and uh, along with other organisations and not just us that show what we can do in our profession to actually uh, ensure that, that merit and talent wherever it comes from um, are generally rewarded, can be achieved and that there are as few blockages in the system as possible. Yeah. I think our viewers will be so reassured to hear you saying that and agreeing that talent can come from anywhere because it's something that we talk about a lot um, in the graduate recruitment team and it's very easy um, to, to hear it from us when we're kind of client facing to the candidates who are applying but to hear it from the top I think is so reassuring and important that that message is right through our whole but it's, firm. It's the right thing to do, it's the right thing to do sort of ethically, morally it's the right thing to do from a business perspective because what business wouldn't want the best talent it could find, mm. regardless of where it comes, yeah. from, comes from? Why narrow your options? So I think there are all sorts of good reasons to do it. Perfect. Um, so just um, popping back to another question that came through Instagram um, and following on quite nicely, I guess, from uh, our discussion <coughs> about social mobility, JD Coop asked, um, do you think A-levels make or break your chance in law? <laughs> I think it's quite an interesting question. I mean, clearly a, <clears throat> a total car crash at A-levels um, uh, isn't, isn't helping anyone's career progression. Um, but I think it's really important that, um, uh, again, sort of maybe playing off the social mobility piece to an extent, 
um, the organizations are very careful about not inadvertently creating a, an elitist um, approach because they set artificially high entry levels, be that through uh, expected grades from A-level, be that through um, uh, anticipated um, degree results. Um, uh, good people are, are good people. And I guess, you know, there's, there's a balance to be achieved, um, but I wouldn't say A-levels are a car crash, and I think organisations are actually prepared to entertain an application from someone who's got onto a law degree but maybe has three Cs or a mm. B and three Cs at A-level. Absolutely, why not? Yeah. Um, anyone that's worked in law for a bit realises that the amount of time you spend dealing with hard law is the minority of your time for most people. Um, I'm not sure this is scientific, but I've heard it said, you know, the 80-20 split, 20% of your time as a practicing lawyer is law, 80% are other skills. So whilst there's definitely a minimum level of experience you would want anyone to have an ability as a lawyer, mm. actually as a lawyer you're using all sorts of other skills, you know, project management, negotiation skills, you know, softer people skills. There's a whole range of, of things that actually you can be really, really good at without necessarily being the number one lawyer in that space yeah. in the UK. You don't have to be absolutely at that apex. Um, many, other, many other skills come to play. And perhaps, you know, perhaps maybe in trouble saying this, maybe if you're at the apex, you're an extreme in terms of your ability as a lawyer, maybe you're a bit weaker at those other things. You know, life tends to be like that. Who's, yeah. who's good at everything? Um, so no, I wouldn't say it's make or break. Um, uh, and I guess maybe one other answer is, actually if they really haven't gone as well as people would hope, then I would say don't give up. Um, think again. Um, think again about maybe maybe your A-levels, or think again about another entry into law. Yeah. Um, that there are there's more than one entry um, into law. You know, ILEX, paralegaling, what whatever, um, or indeed maybe other skill sets. You could work in a law firm, but maybe not as a lawyer. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I did a law degree, but I'm not a lawyer, so. You saw, the light. you saw the light. <laughs> <laughs> um, so just a reminder that you can type in your questions into the comments box and we will come to those in a second. Um, we've had some more uh, questions that came through Instagram before today. So we're going to answer those first before we jump to your questions. So um, firstly, Simon, Emily Arnold asked, how do you think the role of a trainee solicitor has changed? Uh, quite a lot, actually. Um, and I think that's a combination of... of of things. Um, one is the quality of the training. I think compared to, uh, if I think back to myself and the skill sets such as they were that I brought as an article clerk compared to the quality that we see um, today, it, it's radically different. People are much better prepared um, for the world of work um, and as a trainee um, compared to myself. Equally, the expectation from the firms has changed. Um, it's higher, the firms want more, mm -hmm. um, trainees cost more, so, so why not? Um, uh, you know, I was given a pack of colouring pencils when I started because working in property, the technology wasn't there to do it other than colour it in. You know, clearly that doesn't apply now. Um, trainees now are not, um, and if they are, it's a mistake. You need to have a think about what you're doing. They're not back backroom people. They're mm. not. They're not doing the copying. They absolutely shouldn't. They shouldn't be doing the colouring in. Not that, that happens anymore. Um, it needs to be client facing. That two years goes in a flash. Mm. And harping back to what I was saying earlier around um, maybe. Uh, a problem these days is focusing too early and becoming too specialist too early. Um, that two years is, is, is a really short window to actually try some, try some different things. And firms, firms have to ensure that the opportunity to work on real stuff, real files, real clients, have FaceTime with clients, go on to comment, all that sort of thing, I think is really, really important and get as much experience in there as possible. Yeah. Um, I think that's how it's changed. Um, uh, it certainly felt we were... Um, uh, Cheap labour to an extent. Um, there are some things we did, you know, uh, hand deliveries. You know, who would send a trainee on a hand delivery now? Mm. Would use a courier. Um, personal service, not allowed to do it for really, really good, um, you know, safety, welfare reasons now. Um, but all that was going on then, driving around in partners' cars, handing, handing over bits of paper, delivering contract. You know, the, we did some really quite menial stuff. It's changed hugely and for the better. Yeah, okay, fantastic. Um, so the branding man, he has asked, what, uh, what has been your biggest mistake and how did you recover? Um, I've made so many mistakes um, in so many ways um, over the years. There just isn't enough time for me to name the ones I can remember. Um, uh, but I think probably the one I would share um, uh, was as a trainee, um, being involved in a corporate completion at a time when uh, the buyer was paying for it by way of banker's draft. So I can't remember the reasons why, probably because it didn't ex exist, but no electronic transfer. 
Um, and the meeting was running on, and they wanted the bankers draft into the bank before the bank shut at 5.30 or 5. Um, uh, so I was dispatched to take this to the bank. What I hadn't realised was um, that the firm actually had two branches in the same city, um, and I went to the wrong branch, which didn't bank that particular side of the business. So I remember running across town, getting in on time, wandering back to the office, sauntering probably, thinking, you know, job done, um, uh, and arriving back in the office to a very red-faced partner who had had the call from the bank to say, we've had this uh, draft, but we can't, we can't cash it. At which point he thought his whole completion meeting was going down, and probably my job was on the balance at that point. Mm. It got sorted. The two banks did have a conversation, and they agreed to, to deal with it in some way, which probably saved my bacon. Um, uh, what did I learn? Probably best to read the address on the envelope <coughs> rather than assume anything, because it was there in front of me. I just went to the branch that I'd always worked with. Yeah. So, um, yeah, assumptions can be very difficult, as we know in life, let alone as a lawyer. I got away with it anyway. So read the yeah. detail. Oh, it's always in the detail, isn't <laughs> yeah. it? It's always in the detail. Um, okay, fantastic. So Ed Morris, he asks, what advice would you give to an incoming trainee? So Ed is a future trainee solicitor at Shoesmiths. He'll be joining us in a couple of years. So what advice would you give him? Well, hopefully Ed's listening. Hi, Ed, um, if you're out there. Um, a little bit of what I was touching on a moment ago, which is just come in and throw yourself at it. That, that two years will, will fly. Um, don't be afraid to ask. Um, not just about things you're unsure about, but actually if you want to experience something, if you want to see something, if you're in a particular team and there's an area of that, what that team does, ask whether you can have exposure to that. Um, uh, there will undoubtedly be some common opportunities if you're interested in that, ask. Um, uh, the way I describe it, and it's um, a bit corny in a way, but just be a sponge. It's, it's an opportunity just to soak up as much information around the areas, um, the types of client, the types of work over those two years and just help form a view as to what direction you want to go in on qualification, after qualification. Um, if I could change it, I would keep a breadth of work going after qualification mm -hmm. for a couple of years um, to allow people to continue to build their skill sets. Uh, being a real estate lawyer but understanding more about how corporate transaction work is, I'm going to take one example, is extremely useful. Yeah. Um, or how insolvency works is extremely useful and actually seeing how that works in greater deal in practice. You might not get all of that as a training contract. However, those two years is what we've got at the moment, so um, uh, just immerse yourself in it and enjoy it because it's a fantastic time. Yep, okay. Um, we've got a question from uh, La Lakin who wants to know what makes Shoesmiths unique? <laughs> um, that's a really interesting question, a really good question because actually what does differentiate law firms? Um, and you can point to differences. You can point to big global law firms, you can point to high street law firms. There are uh, undoubtedly some, some, some differences. But equally, you put law firms of a similar type, similar nature, and actually what makes them different. Um, uh, and it's a slightly more difficult question to answer. So in that sense, it's a good question. In relation to Shoesmiths, um, uh, and it's, it's true, but you might say predictable, it's all about the people. Um, you can invest in your IT um, uh, infrastructure and of course you must but does that differentiate you in the end probably no um, uh, you can invest in the sort of the physicality of the brand but in the end does that differentiate you um, in the end no you can talk about values um, uh, and your culture um, but it's in in the end it comes back to people um, and it's about actions not about words it's about how those people work together how they behave how they collaborate how they work with their clients, how they spend time understanding what their clients are really about. No client is ever the same. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and really tailoring their thinking to what that client's particular needs are. Um, working with colleagues. Um, uh, asking for help and giving help. I mean, these are really, really important things and really basic things. But of course, um, no firm, I think, will achieve its potential if actually it's a bunch of individuals all pursuing their own objectives. It is the collective. Um, so what makes you Smith unique? I think it's the way we do that. Um, the culture, the values, um, they're the foundations that this firm has been built on for many, many years, way before my time. But it's what attracted me here back in mm. 2005. Um, it's what's attracted, I think, all of the partners here without fail. Um, uh, and almost everyone I can think of here. I can't think of anyone that um, isn't here because actually the, the way we are, the way we work, the, the way we support each other, that sort of collaboration thing and that sort of 
how, what that brings in terms of good business sense, that collective clever, yeah. um, the power that actually the, the, the team has over the individual. And I think, that, I think our clients really get that. Yeah, and I think on um, <clears throat> law firm websites, especially on the graduate recruitment pages, um, similar law firms all describe themselves in similar ways, that we have um, a, an approachable partnership and that you'll get um, great client contact early on and um, great responsibility. So it's very difficult for viewers to really differ differentiate between the law firms when we all say a very similar thing. So that's why I definitely advise um, trying to get into an insight evening or work experience placement or watching these videos to feel a bit more of that culture and understand a bit more about whether their values align with yes. you. I spend um, a significant amount of my time uh, looking at partner recruitment. <clears throat> um, and Peter, our chairman, and myself, each of us meets every potential partner recruit. Um, all the usual sort of good business stuff, but actually also to sign off on the values piece. Um, that that individual will be a good fit for Shoesmiths um, and will work in terms of our values. And actually what I hear in return is from all of those partners over, over all, of, all of the years that we've done this now is that um, I hear it from one partner and I go and see the next one and I hear it and I see it and I experience the same type of messages. And, and at each next conversation I expect to sort of the, the true face of the organisation to show, but I only ever hear um, what I hear in the first one. It's, it's, it's replicated and repeated. It is consistent across this business. That's not something you can buy. Mm. Um, it's created through many, many years of building that, that, that culture um, and that, that feel. Um, it can't be quickly, quickly re replicated and to that extent, to come back to the question, that's why it's unique. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, so we've got, let's see, um, Lydia Rose Linda Aspinall, very long name here. Um, she would like to know, have you ever experienced the feeling of imposter syndrome and how did you overcome it? <laughs> um, who hasn't felt an imposter syndrome at some time? Who hasn't had that little voice um, nagging at the back of the head saying, I'm not quite sure how I ended up here? Uh, if I was being completely honest, I've got one of those now. How did I end up here? You know, come back to what I said earlier on, you know, I wasn't even sure whether I wanted to be a lawyer. Um, uh, I think everyone experiences some doubt, if you want to put it in a different sense, um, as to, 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 to why they're, they're doing. I guess there are degrees, and I acknowledge that. Um, and for some people this can be um, really serious um, uh, and they, they should look for help on that um, uh, from people around them, from people they trust, maybe professional help I don't know at the most serious end. But, but for most people it's just part of your inner, inner confidence um, and we all perhaps go from days when we're slightly more confident and slightly less confident. Um, what I'd say is actually acknowledge the voice and then just get on with it. Um, uh, get to the edge and step off. Um, how bad can it be? Um, uh, and actually echoing something I said earlier, if you need help, ask. Yeah. Um, uh, I've certainly through my career has been helped hugely um, by many people along the way. Um, uh, and you'll be surprised when you ask for help how, many, how willing people yeah. are. Especially if you help in return. Um, if you've helped someone along the way, that'll be understood, it'll be seen by others and you'll find that actually people will come to your help when you need a bit of help on something. So. So that interaction, but yeah, everyone gets a bit of self-doubt once mm. in a while. It's not the worst in the world. Maybe it motivates you to try a bit harder or do a bit better. Okay, thank you. Um, that's been really insightful, thank you. Um, so just a reminder, if you want to ask a question, type it into the comments now and we will get to those in a second. But um, while you're typing your questions, I'm going to ask, Simon, do you have any questions for me? Yeah, I've got uh, a couple of really tricky questions for you, a couple yep. of bouncers. Um, so <clears throat> I was thinking about, uh, uh, this subject uh, and my own experience um, <clears throat> and I was wondering what is it that trainees want to know today, the current generation of trainees compared to the sort of questions they were asking five, certainly ten years ago. How has the sort of the, the expectation changed in, in that sense? Yeah, so I think um, the amount of or the ability to research into law firms um, online now and the encouragement to <coughs> <coughs> sorry the encouragement to get out to events and law fairs and understand a bit more about um, law firms and the culture means that people are a bit more switched on, it's highly competitive. So the questions that are coming through are quite in depth. But what we've really noticed is that people want to know, they can see themselves in the firm, they're picturing that ahead of the time and really trying to understand um, 
how they will fit into the daily life. So asking questions about um, more about the working environment, having already thought about, okay, this is the type of law firm I want to work for, this is the type of work, and I understand I'll get this salary. They know all of that from the research they've done, so then they're actually picturing themselves in the business. And I think you touched on um, climate change being something that people value within a business now to feel like they're um, doing something good. And that's the type of questions that we're being asked about. Um, what are she Smith's commitments to um, climate change? What are they to sustain being a sustainable business? What are we doing to recycle or reuse, reduce? Um, and we really tried to share part of that message on our assessment days um, this year where sustainable sustainable businesses were the key theme um, of the events mm. and um, if you've been following us on social media you know that we've really been championing um, BB's wraps which are like an alternative to cling film an environmentally friendly alternative um, and if you're going to meet us at a law fair then you might be able to get your hands on one of those as well so yeah I think that's where we're seeing the questions are changing in terms of what prospective trainees are thinking about because not all law firms are the same. No, they're so not. So actually, no. and, and there's no right or wrong in this, except trying to work out what sort of culture, what sort of organisation do you see yourself in and, yeah. and, and, and you think you'd be comfortable and, and, and happy and, and, and flourishing. Um, so I guess what I'd be asking now, which I absolutely didn't ask 35 years ago, um, was, was around, will be around that. Um, questions when I was coming through were more around quality of the training and what I was going to get paid. Because none of that was visible. Yeah. Um, so the sort of the visibility you talk to, I think, has, yeah. has, has, has changed. So it takes it to another level. Um, the other question I was wandering around is something else that we, we are working really hard on. I don't think we're in a bad place on it overall, but, but we've definitely got work to do, um, which is around gender and diversity. Um, uh, and I wonder whether you had any views around um, really driving the gender debate and actually tackling it in a way that perhaps is more aggressive than it has been tack uh, tackled already is around quotas mm. um, and whether organisations should, should begin to look to set quotas for things like gender to, to encourage greater change. Yeah, so I think um, it's something that's been in the news a lot um, recently, certainly in the past uh, year to two years um, with the, the gender pay gap information that firms were um, had to share. I think that it is fantastic to have a target, um, to have a goal and something that we are aiming to reach. But I think that's got to be backed up by with a plan for how we get there. So I read a lot about um, a business wants to reach 33% uh, female partnership, for example, but there's no information on how they will reach that target. <coughs> um, and I think that that would be really, um, that should always be underpinning that statement. Um, so I think it is great to have a target to reach, yeah. I think I've got there in the end. I had some initial reservations because why would you want to suggest uh, there was anyone in their position other than because they were worth it, because they were good enough, um, or indeed that the best the business can find. But actually, I, uh, having thought about it some more, uh, there's also a piece around what gets measured gets done. Mm. And if you look at the sort of the bright light that was shone, shone on uh, gender pay gap, um, and this isn't about law firms particularly, but the response from business to a actually being held up and being much more accountable to that, it's driving change. So I think actually there is there is something in it, but I think it absolutely has to sit around actions, which I guess again is what you're all talking about, and it's it's not just words, that actually organisations have plans, they're rolling out those plans, they can talk to those plans, and that the change actually can be measured and seem to be progressing. Yeah, I think it's really easy to think about the quotas in terms of that end piece mm. as well. But ultimately, it should be the best person for the job gets the job. Um, but that might mean widening the pool at the very beginning. So if we were talking about gender, for example, are we making sure that we're um, making our job adverts as attractive to women as we are to men um, and making sure that our systems um, for support once people are inside the business mean that they feel comfortable to progress at a similar level. So I think it starts way right back at the beginning and it's almost like some firms tackle it from that very end point of where they want to get without thinking about that beginning piece. Yes. Yeah. Yep. Um, okay, so what I'm going to do is just um, jump on to see if we've <coughs> had any questions come through from you guys who are watching. So bear with me for just one second. <clears throat> Uh, 
there's always a little bit of delay in the questions coming up and the way that um, Facebook publishes our video. So we are live, um, but there's usually <clears throat> about a 30 second delay. So just bear with me. Okay, so we've got quite a few comments in here. So let's have a look and see. Um, and some of these questions we've already answered. So like Ellis, she asked, what would you say makes Shoesmith stand out from other firms? So we've already talked about what makes us unique and what differentiates us. Um, Andy Waller, he says, most firms want a 2-1 degree. Can you reassure people with a 2-2? Two -two? Yeah, I can. Um, I don't think de degrees themselves necessarily are um, the ultimate limit. Why, why would you set 2-1 as an automatic standard? Um, I think uh, just like why would you uh, restrict yourself to a, a small number of universities? Um, my view is through our selection process we will find the best people that actually suit the skill sets um, that we're looking for. Um, uh, I have a 2-2. Two -two. I would feel slightly hypocritical sitting here saying, actually, that's not good enough. So, no, I would absolutely not set the benchmark there. <laughs> yeah. um, it's about the individual and their rounded skill sets, not just about their academic achievement. Yeah. And just to reassure you that at Shoesmith, we don't have a minimum um, degree level to apply for a training contract. So if you've got a 2-2 two -two or a pass, um, then you can still apply. Uh, so, yeah, you should be reassured that that's absolutely fine. Um, Amiral, he asks, uh, what would you say is the best way for somebody to get their foot in the door for a firm like Shoesmiths, even if they don't have very much work experience? Um, I think come and see us. Come and see us on our open days. Come and, come and see us in the colleges if you can. Um, if, you can't, if you can't do that, contact us in some other way. Drop me an email. Do, do something and we can, we can pick that up. I think in terms of the foot through the door itself is around work experience. Um, uh, and again, we have a number of programs that can help people in terms of work experience, or, or indeed as, as do other law firms. But I think just, just find a way to make that contact and start the conversation going and then we can work it out from there. Yeah, yeah. and these videos, watch these videos, apply for an insight evening, um, try and get as much contact as you can with law firms that you're interested in, because that will all build up your knowledge. <clears throat> so Andrea has asked, what impact has the implementation of AI tools um, had on the firm? So this will be a really popular topic that our viewers will be interested in knowing, yeah. but basically what is Shoesmith doing in terms of tech and AI? Yeah, quite a lot actually. Um, uh, in terms of the specific question, what, what impact is, um, I mean, I guess the implication of that question is, are we seeing radical changes to our, to our teams? Um, uh, and the roles that they, they, they undertake? The, the, the answer is, at the moment, no. Um, uh, we've got a whole number of projects um, running in terms of automation, um, AI, data management. Um, and I think that's just allowing our lawyers to, frankly, just work in a different way rather than um, being replaced by some robotic um, process. Uh, so, for instance, you know, give you one example. Uh, one of our teams over the last couple of years has developed with an external um, supplier um, a bit of technology that will um, data extract, um, read if you want, uh, commercial contracts. Um, uh, and uh, we ran a little test, a um, uh, humorous test, uh, a little while ago, and uh, they can um, produce a contract report uh, tailored to the client and risk assess, assessed in about 90 seconds. So faster than I could eat two cream crackers, cold, dry as it were, mm -hmm. which they made me do, um, or faster than someone could buy a pint of beer and drink it. Um, you know, that sort of speed is what clients want. Um, of course, there's a cost, cost somewhere in there in the client's mind, but really what clients really want is, 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 is that speed quality dynamic. So to move from something that, uh, if we'd done it manually, it might have taken two or three hours, to something that takes 90 seconds, mm. um, uh, has an accuracy level of between 95 and 100%, um, uh, which is higher than actually if we'd got a, a junior lawyer to do it, interestingly. Um, uh, and actually has produced something that you can get to the client quickly, but also risk assess. So again, the, the pinch points, the high risk areas, leap off the page, as it were, through a color code. You know, it's, it's one example, but, but there's, there's lots of things going on. If you broaden this out, the one thing that no law firm has worked out to do yet is what to do with its data. Um, most law firms hold very few assets. Um, 
property. Uh, intellectual property is very, very limited. Most of them are like us. They sit in a rented office with some furniture and some IT kit and a whole load of people. People are the real asset. But there's masses of data in there. Mm. And, and law firms are really, really poor at understanding what that data is telling um, in terms of, I don't know, transaction flows, value, whatever. Um, uh, and actually be able to re retell that story and present it back to the market in a way um, that is interesting and valuable to the market. We haven't cracked it. A law firm that can really crack that, I think, is onto something. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. Um, so let's see. Uh, Brooke has asked, how have your efforts in diversity and inclusion over past years um, affected the efforts in other long-standing issues such as gender equality within the firm? So have our efforts in diversity and inclusion affected gender equality, for example? Yeah, absolutely. Um, <clears throat> uh, our partner, if you take the, the partner measure, um, which is where I think the challenge is for most law firms, uh, we are just under 40% um, female partnership. Um, in a way, that's not good enough because, you know, if things were perfect, you'd go 50-50. But um, uh, we're definitely um, uh, not in a terrible place, but I think there's probably a bit more we can do. Um, the tipping point um, between sort of when does it begin to sort of shift from, from more male to female, um, we've, see, we've seen move up. Um, a few years ago, it was somewhere around associate, senior associate in that space. Um, and it begins to tip over now between our senior associate level and partner level. Um, that needs to continue to move up the page. Um, things get in the way. Um, recruitment, interestingly, gets in the way. Um, you, you look at a, um, a, a retainer um, for a particular headhunt, you need to make sure that the lists that come back from your agents are balanced. Mm. Um, not that you're presented with something that leans, put it this way, you know, all men, no women. Um, so all, all of our retained agents have a brief in terms of ensuring that if it's not a 50-50 split, um, we have to have an explanation as to why, otherwise it's a way you go and try harder. Um, uh, in terms of actually supporting talent coming through, um, so specific um, uh, mentoring, support, training, um, to ensure that actually um, women go through smoothly into partnership just as well as men is really, really important. Mm -hmm. um, and I feel, feel encouraged, empowered and expected in a way that that should happen. Um, there's, there's, there's loads you can do, but uh, yeah, we've still got a bit of work to do at the top end. Um, but the direction of travel we can see is, is definitely changing and improving. Yeah, um, <clears throat> we do have a dedicated um, diversity, inclusion, and well-being team as well, yeah. um, <clears throat> which I think goes to show the firm's commitment to driving that agenda. Yeah. Interestingly, we were looking at the uh, promotion long lists just a couple of weeks ago um, across all levels for the firm for the next round. Um, and all of them had a 50% or more female representation, top to bottom. Um, which may be the first time we've had that, but it was really interesting to see and, it's in, and, and really encouraging that that's where the talent is. Mm. It's not artificial, that's where the talent is. And anyway, that's, it comes about the sort of talent and realising talent, that's where the most exciting thing is, getting the best people to, to, to actually progress and do well and help the business do well. <clears throat> are you also finding that clients are asking us about um, these issues as well, on climate change and gender <coughs> and diversity? Are they... Um, almost putting pressure on law firms to make sure that we're on top of this? Um, the, the answer is yes, um, uh, and increasingly so. Um, some of it is formal, so through tender structures where um, you get very direct questions around where your stats sit, where your gender pay gap sits, where your policies sit, um, in these sort of areas. Um, others it can be informal, um, uh, which can be a, a simple conversation with, with a uh, a key client contact, a CEO or a, a GC, where they actually they, they want to know, look you in the eye and say, okay, so what's what's the gender split in the partnership? Mm. Um, the more, more discerning ones will go, okay, so what's your partner structure? Okay, so you've got three levels within your partnership. What's your gender split in each level? So some um, will push you, push you quite hard, and quite rightly so. Um, uh, so I, I think all, all, of, all of these wider um, issues, by which I, I don't limit to necessarily um, gender or diversity alone, but you mentioned, we've mentioned a couple of times, climate. I think, I think that all of these sort of wider issues that businesses need to be thinking around, um, you need to have a story to tell. You need to be able mm. to explain how you're addressing some of these questions that, that need to be addressed and there need to be plans. And, and as I said earlier, it's not just about having plans, it's about the, the actions. Um, I'm talking about actually some of the things you've done to make change. Okay. So um, I think that brings us to the end of most of our questions, um, but I'd like to finish really on um, you sharing your top tip for candidates who are about to apply for an insight evening or a training contract. 
What is your top piece of advice for them? Do your research. Um, uh, as we said earlier, there's, there's lots of information. Um, uh, do your research. Um, in terms of coming onto the, onto the selection programmes, um, it's unhelpful in a way, but because it's easy said and perhaps harder to do in those environments, but genuinely be yourself. Um, be as relaxed as, relaxed as you can. Um, I, would, I would say this, wouldn't I, but if you're in the right organisation with the right sort of selection process, it will help you through it. It will support you and it will allow you to show who you are and what your true talents are. Um, if you feel there's a selection process, it actually is, is, is more about barriers and challenges rather than enabling people to shine, then maybe that's not the firm for you. But um, mm -hmm. yeah, do your research, be yourself, um, and give it, give it your all. Yeah. Um, you've got nothing to lose. Perfect. Um, <clears throat> thank you so much, Simon, for joining me on She Smith's Live today. Your really pleasure. appreciate it. Yeah. <clears throat> I've got a bit of a froggy throat, sorry. Um, so if you want us to share um, the Insight Evening application uh, link, then just comment yes in the comments now and we'll make sure we send you a direct message so you can apply for our Insight Evening. <clears throat> our Insight Evening application is open right now and the deadline is the 30th of November. Now we hold an Insight Evening in every one of our locations where we recruit trainees. So it's a fantastic opportunity to really come into the office, meet our people, um, hear some of our um, partners talking about their experience, um, spend some time networking, go build up your commercial awareness um, and just really great to see that office environment. So please do apply for an Insight Evening if you want to learn a little bit more about Shoesmiths. Um, I'm certain your advice is going to be really appreciated by all of our viewers. We are live again on Wednesday the 9th of October where I'll be talking to some of our trainees about different areas of law. So if you want to add a reminder to your diary for that, you can just hit events on Facebook and you'll see all of our future Facebook Live videos on there. Um, if you've got any more questions, then you can email us at joinus at shoesmiths.co.uk or of course type them into this comments box. We will still respond to these after the live video. Once again, Simon, thank you so no, thank much. Thank you very much. Thanks for watching. I've just had coffee with the CEO.